Oh, hi, sorry, I didn't see you there. I'm out fishing today. See, I've got my fishing rod, and remember this bait from the end of my last Percy Jackson video? I'm glad they never made a sequel to it. It is I'm working like a charm. I've never seen such an I, effective I bait. I'm even reeling some in from Twitter and Reddit. It's actually a bit... Ah! Oh, sorry about that. Where was I? Oh yes, so the reason I made that comment was because I wanted to get people talking about the Sea of Monsters. I wanted to know what the main general consensus was. I knew that it had an even worse score than the original on Rotten Tomatoes and Letterboxd, but did my comments think that? Yeah, apparently they do. The general consensus seems to be that the Sea of Monsters is also very, very bad. Even worse than The Lightning Thief. Which is where I'm gonna have to let you all down. I personally didn't think it was worse, as an adaptation at least. Maybe if you look at the films on their own and ignore the books they're based on, it might be, but I think that's because The Sea of Monsters is the weakest story out of the books. But as an adaptation, almost all of the problems can be attributed to them trying to retcon this. The worst book to movie adaptation of all time. And a lot of you tried to argue me on this point, even some of my friends. Like, I had a heated debate in a beer garden about this the other day. And I concede, if you genuinely enjoyed The Lightning Thief, I would like to apologize to absolutely none of you. The book is always better. Hold all of these L's. Well, you know, except this one, because I need that to spell virtual private network or VPN, because this video is sponsored by Surfshark. You know, the fast and secure VPN that's really easy to use, like ridiculously easy to use. I've been living with my grandmother since the start of the lockdown and I've even got her using Surfshark. I mean, she didn't set it up, nor does she know how to turn it off, but it's a testament to them that even your grandmother can use it, even though I imagine most of you aren't grandparents and are probably closer in age to me, which means you probably use the internet a lot. And installing Surfshark will not only protect your data by encrypting your personal information and send you alerts anytime your email or password gets compromised, but it also makes the internet a much bigger place. Providing you with access to other countries' YouTube, Disney+, Plus, or Netflix, meaning you can watch things that aren't available in your country, which actually, matter of fact, I've been using Surfshark over the last month to access the American Netflix so I can watch the US office for the first time ever and I thoroughly enjoyed it. You know, up until Michael left the show and then it kind of went downhill a bit. And if you use my code Gorman, G-O-R-M-A-N, you get a massive 83% off plus three extra months for free. Also, there's a 30 day money back guarantee, so there's literally no risk. Link is in the description down below. Checking it out would help the channel a lot. And with that said, let's get back into the sea of monsters because in my opinion, this film does two things. Just two things, that's all. Firstly, it tries to retcon the original film a bit, I guess in an attempt to appease the fans of the books who were disappointed with the first film in the hope the stories can line up a bit more, but it doesn't really work. Mostly because, secondly, they continue to make up stuff as it goes, creating even more holes and problems, making you think this wasn't very well planned, was it? And in doing so, they let down both sets of fans. You know, it's kind of like The Rise of Skywalker, which just saying those three words is going to create a debate in the comments, isn't it? I regret everything. Which actually, learning point here, it's absolutely impossible to create a crowd-pleasing film if you're following up a divisive one. Like, just don't bother. Star Wars ended with The Last Jedi, I'm perfectly happy with that. And I realize that's gonna create another debate, so, you know, there's no winning. So let's dig into this first thing, because I have a bit of respect that they at least tried to put the pieces together. And I'd have been happy for this film to take one for the team and completely suck if it helped set up a strong end to the series. Obviously, that's not what happened, but I can see what they were trying to do. So it opens with the backstory to Talia's death. They forgot to mention this, in the first film and now it's super important so flashback scene and I promise it doesn't remove the suspense about her coming back in the end like in the book I wouldn't have seen it coming but in this they reference it so many times it felt glaringly obvious like oh I wonder why they keep referencing this thing that happened six years ago is it gonna come back later <laughs> but I mean at least we got one scene where the half-bloods are actually the age they're meant to be like it didn't look good nor was it well acted but it's canon <laughs> then we're introduced to Percy Grover and Annabeth all at Camp Half-Blood which yes they did just skip over the entire first four chapters of the book, but this isn't the fault of the Sea of Monsters, it's because the Lightning Thief decided to change the ending and now all the characters are in the wrong place! I don't know, for example, Percy doesn't go back home to live with his mum, so it's pretty hard for them to introduce Tyson at his school that year because apparently he doesn't go to school anymore, leading to Tyson having to get retconned into the story, and apparently he just walks into camp, which, I mean, that works, I guess, and I'm gonna be honest here, 
I really didn't like Tyson's character in this film. I would die for him in the books, and there aren't that many characters in the Percy Jackson books I'd die for. Only like him, Annabeth. One minute, 37 seconds later. Blackjack. Several days later. Nico. Three weeks later. Mr. Blowfist, obviously. Two thousand years later. That bystander when he falls off the gateway arch. The point is, in this film, Tyson really just didn't work for me. I always imagined him to be very disorientated, completely out of the loop, needs everything explained to him and he's just not. They call him dumb a few times, maybe to try and convince us he's not the sharpest knife in the place where they keep the knives, but in my opinion that's a classic example of telling not showing because they don't show him being dumb and that's not great storytelling. Honestly, if he had two eyes for the entire film, he wouldn't have even stood out that much as a demigod. Whether that was down to the performance or if the writing just didn't make him dopey enough, I'm not 100% sure, but whenever he had a Tyson-y line, it just felt so forced. Bad ball. And it's not like he's the only character in this film whose lines felt forced, trust me, but I just, I didn't like him. There's also the minor issue that Grover didn't end the last film in the right place. He was still at camp when he was supposed to be out searching for Pan. So to resolve that, some of Luke's guys attack them while they're on their quest and kidnap him with the plan of using him to get to Prometheus, which I guess maybe kind of makes sense because apparently you need a satyr to lead you to the fleece, but then they let him go off ahead and Percy's still the one who gets the fleece without the help of a satyr and they were just waiting for Percy outside when he comes out, so Luke's plan sucks again, guys. However, they did manage to get about a minute of Grover in a dress, so success! But then, back on topic, I can't work out how Luke managed to survive the fall at the end of the first film and I know they tried to explain it in his very first line. Maybe next time you try to drown someone, First, make sure he's not a demigod who can swim. But like, okay, that doesn't help explain anything at all. I never questioned your ability to swim. It's the fact you fell from this height. Like, the building there on the coast is 50 stories tall and you were higher up than that. Yes, I counted. Which was probably a massive waste of time, but you know. I go the extra mile, make sure to subscribe. If you're okay with just going along with that, him being back is actually quite convenient because he's able to tell Percy there's this big bad prophecy about him that he doesn't know about. Because again, they forgot to mention it in the first film. And then in one of the weirdest just making stuff up as they go, instead of having Chiron not let him hear the prophecy, kind of creating a slight divide and lack of trust between him and Percy, he just lets him go hear the big prophecy, which is now kind of merged with the prophecy from the Sea of Monsters. And apparently it's about turning 20 now, which I guess at least they didn't try and wreck on his age. And they do this all by finally introducing the Oracle, who turns out to be this wonderful plot device, not just there to tell him about the prophecies, but also for exposition to help fill in the audience about Kronos. Because you know, they completely forget to mention him in the first one, which actually, on that topic, you might remember there are a few characters and things they just disregard in the first one that become more important by the end, and they have to wreck on them all into this story. You know, like Clarice, and I'm sorry to say this, but I thought her portrayal was awful. She's meant to kind of be this bully, and I mean, literally her first act in the books is sticking Percy's head down a toilet, but in this, I don't find her the slightest bit threatening. Like, I always pictured her to be very bitter because that's how Ares is, and there are those layers of jealousy towards Percy, but in the film, she is always smiling, even when she's trying to be mean! Like, she's supposed to get a bit of a redemption arc in the Sea of Monsters, and in the books, it's done very effectively. I didn't like her in The Lightning Thief, but by the end of the Sea of Monsters, I was like, you're okay, Clarice. I'm glad you made amends with Percy. And they still try to give Clarice this little redemption arc where she gets to bring the fleece back to camp, but it doesn't work because she's not mean enough to need a redemption arc in the first place. And also, they all go back to camp together, so it's just this ceremonial you get to give the fleece to Chiron while we all stand by you. <laughs> or I can entirely blame the fact this character doesn't work to me down to how we're just told there's this rivalry between them rather than giving the context of the first film due to her sticking his head down the toilet. Yes. I can and I will. The first film's entirely at fault for this. And honestly, there's a couple times throughout the film where I feel like there's even a bit of chemistry between her and Percy, which is just... Ugh. They also introduced Dionysus, and I'm not gonna say this too loudly, but I kind of liked him. I thought he was a genuinely fun character. Remember how they completely ignored the existence of the mist in the first film? I'm kind of jealous of that now because, oh my, the retcon of the mist sucks. And of course, most importantly, they made Annabeth blonde, which they actually went to the effort to get the actress to dye her hair for an entire film, like, can you imagine having that much attention to detail? But the crazy thing is, they don't even address the new hair color, they just 
they just, they just roll with it. Can you imagine doing that? And alongside that, another thing I found really funny was that on multiple occasions, they have to pretend Percy and Annabeth don't realize they have feelings for each other because, you know, the first film did a really good job at keeping that one a secret. But I'm being overly harsh. And as I said, I kind of respected them for trying to put the pieces together. And I'd have been more excited for the third one if they also didn't retroactively keep making stuff up as they go. It was as if there was one guy in the room who was like, you know, maybe we should stick to the books a bit more. Otherwise, the story is just going to become a mess. And another guy who was like, like, oh, we could bring back Kronos. So they did both. And yes, if you couldn't get through this one, I'm not joking. They brought Kronos back. Not even in Luke form. Full on evil Titan Kronos. I mean, he eats Luke and Grover. Only for Percy to start hitting him with his sword, causing his body to break and return to the grave. And then Kronos basically says that must be the cursed blade from the prophecy. Because apparently Riptide that was given to him by Poseidon in this is cursed somehow, making it the blade from the prophecy. Which, like, do we need to be spoon-fed every single piece of plot development here? Like, I'm not just trying to find a weird line to nitpick at. This movie is filled with lines that just feel incredibly forced. Like, I guess they're trying to squeeze bits out of the books, but the story's already so out of place, and... You know what? Let's just go back to the start. I need to show you how many forced lines there are. We have this weird moment where Grover starts listing tournaments to Percy, in which he's lost to Clarice in an attempt to cheer him up, because apparently he couldn't remember if he won them or not, and... That's the entire development to Clarice and Percy's rivalry. Talia's tree gets poisoned, so Chiron smells it and says, Poison. Because, yes, do you not have a poison sense? You'd struggle out in the wild, I'll tell you that. After Percy gets told the prophecy, he just starts expressing his innermost thoughts and confusions to himself out loud. Because I guess they read the book, but then we're hit with the classic issue of how can we depict what Percy's thinking through visual media and... Cut them some slack, that's really hard to do. What am I thinking right now? You got it wrong. I'm thinking about nothing, apparently. <laughs> they decide to go look for Hermes in the hope he knows where Luke is and he's working in the exact UPS store they happen to walk into. And then there's a moment of, oh, well, while we have Hermes here, we might as well throw in that whole apologize to Luke for me line from the books. But Tyson and Annabeth are also there and I don't even know how to put it into words. I guess they really wanted this conversation to be private, but the way they get there, just watch it. Hey, listen, um, wrote this. And then immediately following this, they're just running through Chesapeake Beach, which is confusing because they were just at the Capitol building, have no mode of transport other than their feet. And I've looked it up, that is over 40 miles, so did they just go on a quick run to the coast before sunset? Like, I can't for the life of me work out why this film feels so rushed. You might remember in my video on the first film that I complained about its relatively short runtime? This one was even shorter, like of course it's gonna feel rushed, you condense an entire book into an hour and a half if you cut out the credits. Anyway. Back to the false lines. Luke starts monologuing about how he wants to bring back Kronos and explains his entire plan for the second consecutive film. Annabeth does something smart and quickly feels the need to remind everyone she's the Goddess of Wisdom's daughter, remember? Because I guess they hadn't mentioned that yet or Percy in this film forgot? Either works, actually. When they're on the boat, Tyson starts opening up, but it really comes out the blue. Like, he says, Nobody's ever trusted me with anything before. Then Percy goes, Is it because they're scared of you? Then some sad music starts playing, the camera begins zooming in on him, and I guess he took that as a cue to tell his tragic backstory about how he smiled at some kids and they ran away, like... I don't know, it's just, it doesn't make any sense. They play Piggy in the middle with the fleece as Prometheus chases them around, which isn't a false line as such, but... It's still really weird. Also, Tyson takes an arrow for Percy, but then falls off a cliff into water. So you know what that means? Disney sequel fake out deaths. Yes, this is technically a Disney sequel because Disney bought the company that made this film. And you know what? It's an awfully executed fake out death. Where Tyson inevitably gets healed by the water and ends up swooping in and saving Percy from Luke at the end. Also, Annabeth gets stabbed, so they have to use the fleece to heal her. And then when she's feeling a bit better, she has a really awkward thank you moment with Tyson. And oh man. That's just the list of forced lines from my viewing where I wasn't even looking out for them. I can't even imagine how many are actually in this film. However, with all that criticism out there, I do think some of the sea monsters look good. Like, most of the CGI in this film was... But the hippocampus, I think it held up. And I guess that's it. Actually, wait, no, there's one more weird line. You see, in the final scene where Talia comes back and tells Percy she's the daughter of Zeus, he suddenly starts narrating immediately following that, which is confusing because it pans back onto him and he's talking, but his lips are moving like, Another living child of the eldest gods. I don't know, it's, it's really weird. Then something happens with Kronos' grave and that's it. As a film, it wasn't very good. As an adaptation, it also wasn't very good, but I do think they're in better shape to go into the third film, which I'm excited to review in part three <laughs> of this series. Works every time. And I guess that's all I've got for you guys today. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to leave a like. You can subscribe to my channel by clicking on my face. You can watch another video by clicking here. You can check out my Patreon here and in the description down below. 
Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. You think I'm going to do another bit where I fall over and pretend I caught some bait? Because I'm not.